Again, welcome. I am very pleased tonight to our, uh, introduce our guest who is going to be discussing a new book of his. Um, Matthew Langdon Cost has wanted to be a writer since the age of eight. This is his first traditionally published novel, but he has written two previous works of historical fiction, as well as a mystery trilogy. Over the years, Cost has owned a video store, a mystery bookstore, and a gym. He has also taught history and coached just about every sport imaginable. He lives in Brunswick, Maine with his wife, Harper. There are four grown children, Brittany, Pearson, Miranda, and Ryan. A chocolate lab and a basset hound round out the mix, and now he spends most of his days on his computer writing. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with Matt a little bit prior to um, the setup for this, and I told him that I'm from Miami, so I thought it was really a fascinating subject that he chose, um, Fidel Castro, uh, to discuss in his book. Um, being from Miami, it's a bit of a skewed perspective on Castro. They don't like him much down there. A lot of the friends that I grew up with had family members who immigrated over um, and during, during his, his time, um, you know, leaving Cuba. So uh, I'm very interested nevertheless to hear this presentation tonight because I, I'm excited to gain a greater depth of, of uh, understanding of, um, of where Castro was coming from. So without further ado, I turn the presentation over to Matt Koss. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thank you, Julia. That was a nice introduction. Anyways, I'm Matthew Langdon Cost, and uh, I wrote this book, Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution, I Am Cuba. Um, and it kind of begs one question, because obviously I am not Cuban. So on what authority did I write this book? Usually, you know, it would be written by a Cuban or somebody such as that. Uh, so I'll give you a little background on what authority I believe I had to write this book. Um, the first is that I was a history major in college and was inspired by a Latin American history teacher at that college, Trinity College in Hartford, to uh, write this book. So I wrote the draft of this book back in 1990. And at that point, upon completing it, I realized three things. One was I needed to improve my writing skills. Two, I needed to do more research. And three, I needed to actually visit Cuba to uh, have a more sincere appreciation of that. So over the years, I continued to research uh, for the next 25 years or so this subject. And I worked on my writing in various different venues, published another book, things like that. And finally, in 2016, I got an opportunity to do a self-devised trip to Cuba following the Revolutionary War Trail of Fidel Castro. And uh, that was a two-week trip. And I did in did glean a lot of uh, interesting facts from that trip uh, that I'll share with you through the course of the presentation. So it's really been a work of 30 years uh, in the making of the publication of this book, which came out just this past March at the beginning of the COVID times. Uh, the second reason why I think that I might be the right person to tell it is Cuban history breaks down into two very distinct camps of thought. The first is the carefully manipulated version as presented by Fidel Castro himself. And the other, Julia earlier ascribed to, is sort of a very unhappy and bitter version espoused by the exiles who were forced out of Cuba by Castro, either fled on their own or were forced to leave uh, the Castro Cuba. So perhaps my vision, which I try and come down somewhere in the middle of those two versions, is the most accurate possible. Which leads us to what is historical fiction? And just real quickly, historical fiction can be anything from a romance set in Victorian times that has very little to do with the history, all the way up to what I feel like I do, which is very historically accurate. Um, the, fiction that I use is I have a fictional protagonist, Vicente Bolivar, that is used to cast a spotlight on Fidel Castro and the events of the Cuban Revolution. So let's get into this a little bit and uh, do a little background. I'm gonna give you a little overview of the book 
and the events of the Cuban Revolution, which go from 1953 to 1959. Um, first, I want to play a short video for you uh, that I had uh, made, and it gives some of the overlying facts of what I'm going to be talking about upcoming. I am Cuba, Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution. Who was Fidel Castro? What were the events that made his rise to power in Cuba inevitable? On July 26, 1953, a young lawyer from Havana led a disastrous insurrection against the Moncada military barracks in Santiago, Cuba. The lawyer was captured, imprisoned, granted amnesty, and exiled to Mexico. In December of 1956, he invaded Cuba upon a pleasure yacht named the Grandma with 81 men. Only 18 survived. How did this band of bearded ones, as they came to be called, defeat the corrupt regime of Fulgencia Batista and his United States-backed military? It is in the Sierra Maestra that Fidel became Fidel. Che was working on his timing with the trigger, giving bursts of eight to ten bullets. The casing spinning out of the bottom after being fed in from the long clip on top. The past six months had been a difficult time for him, as the hot and humid weather caused his asthma to act up with limited medicine to treat it. But here, now, in this heady, terrifying moment, he was truly a revolutionary, attacking the forces of the corrupt dictator, fighting for the people. This was what he was meant to be, not a doctor, nor philosopher, but a warrior. The sharp retort to Fidel's telescoped rifle split the early morning air. A flash illuminated his position on the hill overlooking the El Uvero military garrison that was protecting the sugar refinery and lumberyard just east of Pico Turquino in the Sierra Maestra. Juan Almeida was leading the squadron given the task of taking out the northern post. This would allow Raul and his group to capture the barracks housing the bulk of the soldiers. Vicente was part of the advance guard unit under the leadership of Camillo Sinfigo. He realized they were out of position, slightly lost in the dark, as soon as return fire from the garrison began to light up the blackness. Celia aimed down the M1 carbon and pulled the trigger, sending 15 shots in as many seconds in the direction of the barracks, the wooden stock slapping her shoulder in an oddly comforting manner. Working in the urban resistance had entailed hiding from the police by using constantly changing houses and disguises, but now she was finally able to confront the enemy. How did Fidel and his band of bearded ones turn the tides of war? How did 300 revolutionaries defeat 12,000 soldiers in open battle? I Am Cuba, Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution, is an entertaining historical that will answer all of these questions about a man and an event that have had such a powerful and lasting impact upon the world in which we live. So, that brings us to who was Fidel Castro? Fidel, as a young boy, was born outside of Santiago in a small town. His father was a self-made sugar baron who uh, kicked his first wife out in favor of the maid who had fathered Fidel and two of his brothers. Uh, the three of them had led their early lives in the servants' quarters until the father kicked him out and brought them into the house, ended up marrying the maid, and uh, nobody quite knows what happened to the first wife, and uh, sent Fidel and his brothers off to school in Santiago to some of the best schools. But because he was new money and because of the history of his parents, he was sort of looked down upon as a peasant still at these schools. He turned his energy to sports and was outstanding in just about every sport, whether it be basketball or baseball or ping pong. Um, 
he was truly excelled at sports, not so much in his studies, mostly because he did not apply himself in that manner. He goes off to the University of Havana, where he is going to meet his wife, Murda, and they're actually going to get married towards the after he graduates, and they're going to honeymoon in the United States for six weeks in Miami and New York mostly. She came from a very wealthy family. Her uh, father's actually was the lawyer for Fulgencia Batista, who's going to become Fidel's biggest adversary during the Cuban Revolution, uh, and who he is actually leading the revolution against. So uh, interesting little tie tidbit. As he returns from his honeymoon though, Fidel becomes increasingly unhappy with the United States of America, amongst other things, and the things that they have done to the country of Cuba. Uh, the United States had always sort of treated Cuba like the little sister, and from the time of the Monroe Doctrine on, many people thought that Cuba would become a state of the United States of America. Uh, when Cuba was fighting its wars for independence against Spain, uh, the United States kept out of it until the very end. And it was about 30 years in the making, but finally in 1898, Cuban independence was about to be won from Spain when the United States decided that they wanted to dictate the outcome and they swooped in. I know myself, I learned of this as called the Spanish-American War and Cuba's kind of left right out of our history books. But the fact of the matter is Cuba was on the verge of victory when the United States took a, a false pretext to enter the war and then dictate the outcome, which they're going to do. And they spell this out in the Platt Amendment, which happens in 1902. And under the Platt Amendment, uh, the United States is allowed to keep a military base in Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, as well as to interfere in Cuban uh, society and politics at any time for any reason whatsoever. And they're going to do this continuously for the next 50 years um, to the point where when Fidel Castro uh, returns from his honeymoon, the United States owns approximately 75% of the infrastructure of Cuba, the mines, the fruit plantations, the sugar plantations, the roads, the electric grid, is almost all owned by American interest and American businessmen. And then in 1952, the final straw happens when this man, Fulgencia Batista, who is running for president of Cuba in the election, realizes that he's a distant third and is going to lose. And he uh, completes a coup and overthrows the government and becomes the dictator of Cuba. And the United States immediately recognizes him, supports him, and backs him. And between the government of the United States and Fulgencia Batista, the corruption in Cuba continues. And it becomes a playground for the United States in many ways. Not all of Cuba. Most of what people think of as Cuba is just the city of Havana. 99% uh, of Cuba is largely ignored, even today, whereas most tourists will go to Havana, where it's a playground. You know, the weather is beautiful. There's activities to do, certainly back then. And uh, a big player in that becomes the mafia. The mob comes to Cuba. And in Cuba, you can do anything you want. You can gamble. You can see dancing girls. You can get prostitutes of any kind that you want. And uh, Havana, and the Mafia and Fulgencia Batista and the American government worked together to complete this. And so it's this that the 30-year-old Fidel Castro is witnessing. Uh, he's a young lawyer now, and he's doing mostly pro bono work. And he's looking at this corruption and these people that are using Cuba for their own interests. And he decides that it's time to do something about it. And he starts training a group of people in Havana for the purpose of revolution. Um, and it's on the eve of this revolution 
then I'm going to read a short excerpt from the beginning of my book uh, that talks from the point of view of Vicente as he travels from Havana to uh, Santiago to engage in the beginning of the insurrection or revolution. July 25th, 1953, Eastern Cuba. Vicente Bolivar pulled the 1952 Buick to the side of the road as he crested the hill overlooking Santiago. He was weary from the 500 mile plus drive from Havana, but the sight of the sprawling city below illuminated by the mid-afternoon sun at his back revitalized him. It was as if he were home, even though he'd never been here in his life. He opened the door and unpeeled himself from the seat, breathing in deeply the air that was his heritage, his birthright, and his freedom. At just 19 years of age, Vicente was embarking upon the adventure of a lifetime, a thought that didn't slightly hesitate in it as it raced through his brain and disappeared over the mountains and into the sea. His grandmother had told him the endless tales of his ancestors, men and women who roamed this eastern end of the crocodile-shaped nation of Cuba. The day was stifling hot, the humidity rolling up from the ground where it was battered about by the strength of the sun rays. But Vicente didn't notice. His grandmother told him that his blood was made up of the soil from so deep within the history of Cuba that it could not be affected by anything so trivial as air temperature. He squinted his eyes to better see through the haze as he gazed in wonder to the left of Santiago, where the town of Baracoa must lay hidden behind the mountains. Over 400 years earlier, his ancestor Guama had arrived on this easternmost tip of Cuba. He did accompany the great chief Atui and 300 warriors in long canoes who traveled from Hispaniola to bring warnings of the impending arrival of the Spaniards. A shiver went through Vicente as he thought of the valiant battle these ancient Taino natives had put up for years before being all but exterminated by superior weapons, numbers, and disease. The green palm fronds glimmered in an almost translucent white in the glare of the setting sun. Down below, a peasant led up his burrow stacked high with sticks. A chicken wandered the side of the road looking for food, and Vicente could see a ship either coming or going in the port. This serenity would all but be shattered tomorrow. He climbed back into the car and continued down into Santiago. His first stop was the Rex Hotel to pick up three men, and then the train depot for the arrival of Raul Castro. Fidel's younger brother had just turned 22, but his baby face made him appear much younger than Vicente. On the outskirts of town, they all idled in the shade of a small cluster of palm trees until several more cars arrived, and then the caravan proceeded eight miles to the village of Saboni. A light on a tree signaled the thin road to the farmhouse, where the rebels were gathering. Vicente was one of the few who knew why. The next morning, as dawn is breaking, Fidel Castro is going to lead an attack of 124 men and two women on the Moncada military barracks. Um, this is one of the pictures I took on my Cuban trip. I'm not much of a photographer, but I thought I should throw in a few photos here just to prove that I'd actually been there. Um, but as you can see, the bullet holes still are exist in uh, the facade of this building. They've left it intact like it was at the time. Uh, the attack, the insurrection at the time, not yet called it revolution, but called an insurrection, was a disaster. It was poorly planned poorly organized and uh, promptly squashed. Fidel and some survivors escape into the mountains where they're hunted down and killed. Um, and luckily for Fidel, the Archbishop of Santiago is gonna uh, intervene on his behalf and get the military to stop killing the survivors that they capture. Uh, he had baptized Fidel years earlier and was a good friend of his father's. So the Archbishop of Santiago is going to help him out immensely. And so Fidel is captured, but he's one of the few not killed. Him and 30 other survivors are put on trial. And Fidel's broken apart into his own separate trial, where in his defense, 
he gives this some nation of condemn me. It does mat not matter. History will absolve me. He knows for a fact that the judges have no choice but to find him guilty because after all, the country is ruled by the dictator Batista who's not gonna allow any other judgment to happen. And he is indeed uh, condemned to 15 years in prison on the Isle of Pines prison. But after only 18 months in prison, him and the other uh, members of his group, which are either called the Fidelistas or they're sometimes called the M26 movement, the July 26 movement, um, based on the day of their insurrection. Uh, so him and 30 others are released from the Isle of Pine prison, given a political amnesty, uh, pressures brought from the mothers of Cubans, as well as some international uh, countries who convince Batista to let them go. Uh, Fidel worries that he, it is just sort of a ploy to have him assassinated and killed by thugs of Batista. So he goes into self-imposed exile in Mexico, where he begins training for an invasion of Cuba. And that invasion is going to take place in late November, early December of 1956. He's going to load 81 men aboard a pleasure yacht that he was able to purchase called the Grandma and began the journey back to uh, Cuba. And he chooses this place down by Playa Los Colorados, just uh, west of Santiago for his landing. And there are people there that are going to meet him. Uh, unfortunately, the grandma is overladen with people and so therefore is leaky and slow and they hit uh, bad seas and they're three or four days behind in their arrival time which is when they had people planned to meet them and they end up stuck on a sandbar 10 miles from where they were supposed to land as well this is a reenactment which they do every year in cuba of that being stuck on a sandbar. That's actually the grandma in the background, the yacht that they took across the sea from Mexico to Cuba to invade Cuba with 81 people aboard. Uh, they stumble ashore into a mangrove swamp, which is probably worse than the sea that they were in. And by the time they get through the mangrove swamp, they're exhausted. And then they run into an ambush by the Cuban military who's waiting them. And all but 18 of them are killed. Uh, Fidel in 18. Fidel, this is one of Fidel's favorite stories. He tries to convince people that it was Fidel and 12 people casting himself as a messiah-like figure, but in reality there were 18 survivors. Fidel and three others lay in a uh, sugar field, sugar cane field, buried under the dirt to escape detection for five days while the military searches for him. Um, and then when they move on, he finally gets up and starts working his way towards the mountains and safety. Meanwhile, while on the day that he was supposed to land, as a distraction, this man, Frank Pace, uh, led an uprising in the city of Santiago to deflect from Fidel's arrival uh, west of the city. And this second picture shows where there was a failed attack up the <coughs> Spanish steps by uh, his action commander, Papito Tay, who was killed right on the area behind me in this attack on the police station. And the uprising might have been more successful if Fidel had actually arrived on the day plan but he does not arrive and the uprising is squashed and put down. Which brings us to who was Celia Sanchez? Because it was Celia Sanchez that put together the network that was going to welcome Fidel back to Cuba, guide him into the mountains and protect him. And it is actually, it is her people who are going to find the 18 survivors in Fidel and get them into the Sierra Maestra Mountains to safety. Uh, 
she will later join Fidel in the mountains as a warrior and become one of his top strategists and uh, his lover as well. And this is going to, uh, and she's going to be a crucial part of this revolution. And she becomes a key ingredient to Cuba afterwards as well, even though she no longer continues her affair with him, but she becomes one of his top uh, political people in Cuba after the revolution. And one of the people that she brings into play is the gentleman to the right of Fidel, uh, Crescencio Perez, who is the uh, bandit lord of the Sierra Maestra uh, at the time of Fidel's arrival. 50,000 acres of rugged terrain where lawlessness happens and there's really no uh, police or military presence at all because it's so difficult of a terrain to live in. And he's going to guide Fidel at the beginning and then eventually become one of his top commanders. So we're into the winter going towards spring of 1957 at this point. Um, and we're, you know, less than two years away from Fidel Castro uh, winning the revolution. And at this point, he has 28 people and himself hiding out in the mountains, never sleeping in the same place twice so that they can't be tracked down by planes or military patrols or whatnot. And the government, Batista, has claiming that Fidel was killed in his landing and that there is nobody there. So Fidel arranges for a journalist to come into the Sierra Maestra, into the mountains, uh, Herbert Matthews of the New York Times, and he smuggles them up into the, the peaks of the mountains. And he gives an interview there to prove that he is still alive with pictures. And Fidel carefully manipulates this as he does everything else. Uh, I'll just give you a quick clip of one of the things that he does in this. He uh, talks about how Batista's army has battalions of 200 men, but he likes his battalions to be smaller of only about 20 to 30 so that they're more mobile. And while he's talking about this, his battalion, his single battalion of 28 people is marching by and then they'll change clothes and march back past and then move all around and march back past. So it looks like there's many battalions when in reality there is 28 people that is the entire revolution at this point. So I'm gonna jump ahead again through the book, and I'm going to come to the summer of 1958, a little more than a year later after Herbert Matthews comes and when Fidel had 28 people under his command. Now he has 300 bearded guerrillas under his command, and they have carved out a swath in the Sierra Maestra and have become bothersome to Batista and the military. So Batista is going to plan a summer offensive for 1958 in which he sends 12,000 trained soldiers with tank units and bazooka units and uh, the most, you know, a very powerful force, air force support, naval support, to finally roust out these bearded guerrillas or barbudos as they were known, the, the barbudos, Fidel Castro, and, you know, to jump ahead just a little bit, I've kind of given it away, but the 300 beat the 12,000. How is that possible? I'll give you just a few hints here uh, without getting into the meat and potatoes of it. But one is the people, Che Guevara, the doctor, the philosopher from Argentina, who uh, becomes a warrior for Fidel and his top strategist. Or his younger brother, the baby-faced Raul, uh, Raul Castro, who is going to uh, open a second front uh, outside of Santiago on the Sierra Crystal and have a command under his, his own hands. Or the grave digger from Havana, Raul uh, um, Juan Omeda, sorry. 
Juana made it, the grave digger from Havana, who uh, follows Fidel to Moncada, to prison, to exile in Mexico, back on the grandma, and becomes a top commander. As does Camille Sinfigos, who does the same follow all the way from the very beginning, from being working in a haberdashery in Havana to being coming a top commander that's so well known for his bravery and that he would lead ambushes where he would shoot the lead man in the patrol and catch his rifle before it hit the ground and turn it around on the other men in the patrol to use as another weapon against them. And then there's the terrain, the rugged terrain that uh, they controlled. You know, this dark uh, La Plata on the bottom is where Fidel at this point is going to have his command post. And they are gonna attempt to attack him from the sea as well as from the air. And the ground troops are gonna come across from the top here in Bayamo and first venture into Gaisa and Las Mercedes where Che Guevara is gonna meet them again and again and turn them back. But still, if I had never gone to Cuba, this is probably my biggest takeaway, another one of my terrible photographs, by the way, uh, is how 300 Barbudos were able to defeat 12,000 soldiers, and it's the terrain. It was hiking up to the command post, which they've uh, kept intact to this day, so, my son and I hiked up to the command post in a day and between the elevation change and the, I was there in December and it was still 95 and humid. And the path itself was rugged. The foliage was impossible to get through. And uh, I began to realize how easy it would be to ambush and how larger forces would not be able to move through this in any sort of order and how these 300 might have been able to turn the tides on 12,000 as they uh, sort of wandered their way into this jungle terrain. Uh, this is actually Fidel's hut where he and Celia lived. It's built on the side of the mountain, covered over top. There's a 200 drop, foot drop below to a stream below. And uh, they would have meetings here and whatnot. And for the last six months of the revolution, they were stationary in this command post. There were about 12 or 14 other buildings scattered around in similar sort of isolated spots so that, you know, they couldn't be seen from above or by patrols or anything or by, you know, airplanes. Um, but I'm not gonna really get into the battles uh, that, are going to take place over that summer and how those tides were actually turned. Uh, I don't have time for that now, but they were turned and Fidel and the Barbudos were able to uh, make the army retreat. And when they did, Fidel sent his top two commanders on the attack. He sent uh, Che Guevara and Camilla Sinfigos to bring the attack across uh, the island nation towards Havana. And he himself and Raul are going to concentrate their efforts on Santiago. And it's here, it's in uh, Santa Clara, about halfway between Havana and Santiago, that the last major battle of the revolution is going to take place. And Che Guevara is going to lead the guerrillas to victory against the troops. And it's at this point that the dictator Batista realizes that he can't stop the advance upon Havana and everything is crumbling around him. And so he loads three planes with his family and his closest cronies and they flee and leave Cuba. And Che Guevara and Camilla Sinfigos are going to continue on into Havana and take charge of Havana, the capital of Cuba. And Fidel himself, is going to take much longer to get there. He's going to take a week to eight days to travel across Cuba in this caravan, this parade, uh, stopping in every small town and giving long speeches about how freedom and peace have finally returned 
And everywhere he goes, he's met by cheering, adoring crowds. And if people have vehicles, they pack them with as many people as they can. And they follow the procession of Fidel and his guerrilla group across to Havana. And it just gets bigger and bigger as everybody seemingly in Cuba travels to Havana. And it's uh, here on the last day that my book takes place, which is January 8th, 1959, that Ed Sullivan is going to interview Fidel Castro at two o'clock in the morning in a town office building. And I just, I wanna read just a very quick blip from my book, very short, that just gives an idea, not only that people in Cuba uh, have love and adore Fidel at this point in time, but the world does. Ed Sullivan and the American people do. This is a, a little excerpt taken directly from that interview. Ed Sullivan is talking and he says, the people of the United States have great admiration for you and your men because you are made in the real American tradition of a George Washington or any man who takes on another powerful nation and wins. How do you feel about the United States? Ed Sullivan asked. Fidel replies, the people of the United States are very focused and work extremely hard. I think this is because they come from all over the world, places where they were mistreated and persecuted, and then came together in the United States to form a great nation. Fidel was careful to praise the people while at the same time ignoring the government of the United States. This is because he did like the United States, but he was afraid that he was going to come into conflict with the government of the United States, which he is going to, as we will see. Um, later on that day, he marches into Havana, and that night he gives a speech in front of millions of Cubans, the people of Havana, as well as the people that have followed him across the country of Cuba. And in the course of this six hour long speech that he gives, at one point he's talking about bringing peace to Cuba, finally. After hundreds of years of strife, peace is finally going to return to Cuba. And while he talks, three white doves flutter down and one lands on his shoulder and the other two on the podium. And the people, the millions in front of him, fall to their knees just gasping, and who is this Messiah figure? And they're adoring and they love him. And it's not just there, it's the world over. It's the United States. He's gonna travel to the United Nations later, you know, and come to New York and be met by crowds there. The world loves him, but the government doesn't necessarily. Um, and this is past the you know point of my book, just kind of looking into the future a little bit, but he's going to end up nationalizing things that he feels that foreign interests have stolen from his country. And he's going to bring back to Cuban sovereignty all of the infrastructure that he feels that American businessmen have stolen. And one of the things he nationalizes is United Fruit. And two of the board members of United Fruit happen to be the Dulles brothers. One is the Secretary of State for the United States of America, and the other is the head of the CIA. So as we can guess, he's going to come into contact, a conflict with the government of the United States of America. And I'll just leave uh, off at the very end that uh, Fidel never really put his face on anything from taking power January of 1959 until his death in 2016. There's no shirts, no flags, no banners, nothing with Fidel's face on it. He makes Che Guevara the face of the revolution, whereas uh, he was very simple. And as a matter of fact, I traveled to Cuba. I was supposed to fly into Santiago from Havana the day that he was buried in the Santa Iphigenia Cemetery. And I was bumped off of that flight by more important people that, <coughs> than myself, I guess. 
But I did get there the day after and I was able to visit the cemetery, which has all these national heroes of Cuban history with these great monuments uh, and headstones and whatnot. And then simply there was this one that was a rock with the name Fidel on it. And that's how he's kind of remembered in Cuba is just Fidel. Um, that's my talk for tonight. I would welcome any questions and look forward to them. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt. That was some really, I mean, clearly very well researched background on Fidel Castro. And I certainly learned a lot. Um, we do have some questions that have already come in and it actually started out first with a, a comment. Um, Paul just wanted to mention that there happens to be a film that he wanted to recommend called 1964 I Am Cuba that has a similar name. Um, yeah. And uh, he recommends it as an amazing feat of cinematography, propaganda and Soviet Cuban collaboration um, available on DVD via the library's Minerva, um, et cetera. So, Definitely, if you are interested in the subject matter, that might be something you would like to check out. Um, also, uh, Elizabeth asks, asks a question and says, what was your most important source of information? Um, that would be hard to say, uh, book-wise or anything. Um, there were several great biographies done on Fidel that I thought were very good. But I guess I would have to say that my two-week trip to Cuba mm -hmm. was the greatest source of information I had. You know, as I suggested, it really allowed me to understand how 300 Barbudos could defeat 12,000 soldiers when I went into the rugged terrain and the command post where he was housed. And as well, I got a real great understanding, not only of the Cuban country, but the people and everywhere I went, the Cuban people were very happy. They were all literate and smart and educated and healthy, even though they've struggled with money because of the boycott that has been enacted upon them. Uh, they seem to be a very happy, healthy, and smart uh, group of people. So just understanding that and who they were was really neat. Did you interview a lot of um, older folks who had wanted to talk to you about their experience during this time and their recollection of the event? Um, I, I did, absolutely. And uh, they were happy to share. And you know, what's there's two Cubas. There's Havana, and then there's the rest of Cuba. And uh, Havana is where a lot of the exiles came from, because that's where the wealthy people live. And I think some of the wealthy people uh, were probably not necessarily corrupt and bad and might have you know, fared poorly at the hands of Fidel because he was making quick decisions on who had abused the country and who had not. And uh, some of the wealthy people suffered because of that. But so therefore, a lot of the older people of wealth were no longer in Cuba at that time. Mm. Most many of them had gone to Miami where you were. Um, and uh, so a lot of the older people that I uh, spoke to really loved Fidel mm. and uh, that I interviewed and hit, their lives had improved greatly. And after the revolution, uh, he found houses for all these people and over the years, it's, they've struggled with the economy. And I would argue that a big reason for that is the boycott that the United States enacts upon them, which, by the way, every year there's a vote in the United Nations on that. And 193 countries say that it is an illegal boycott. And two countries, the United States and Israel, say that it is not. So that's, um, but not to get into that, I would just say that the older people felt that they'd been treated very well by the regime. And now often three generations of people will live in the same house, which probably wouldn't make kids here in the US all that happy, but uh, they, they seem, you know, it was kind of a neat thing to see the grandparents and the, and the parents and the kids all together interacting. 
Well, I'm very glad that you had that experience and that you had an opportunity to consider all the diverse perspectives uh, about his um, his reign, his period of time ruling in Cuba. Uh, we have a question that came in from Marcy. It said, did Fidel have children? Did any of them continue his political leanings? And do you know what happened to his first wife? Um, his first wife went into exile in Spain, uh, took herself there, and his son, little Fidel, that they was the sole kid born to the two of them. Um, but he was returned from the mother to Fidel the day that Batista fled the island. And when a week later, when Fidel marched into Havana, he was reunited with his son, little Fidel. And uh, little Fidel is going to live in Cuba with him uh, for the, um, and still does. Uh, but he remained estranged uh, from Murda, his wife, who stayed in uh, Spain. He never married again. He may have married again. That's debatable, actually. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that he never did, even though that there's claim that he did. He's had at least five or six other children with all different women. Um, and some of them have be, remained involved in the government. Uh, as we know, his brother Raul, you know, continued on after him and was with him his entire time. But it's, it gets a little murky as how many kids he has and by how many different women he was, uh, he had many relationships after he came to power. Hmm. We have an excellent question that came in from Elizabeth. It says, what do you think is the advantage of writing the story as fiction versus nonfiction? Um, one of the problems with writing history is you can't know exactly what happened. So any history is really an interpretation of the past. And in something like this, you don't have any audio recordings of actual conversations. So if you're being very historically accurate, you can't include thoughts in people's heads and you can't get into the actual dialogue that happened. And I think that is the sort of thing that really fleshes out the skeleton, if you will. I think that history is just a skeleton and the flesh and blood of it is the emotions and the uh, thoughts and the passions that occur that bring history to life. So I was a history teacher for 10 years and I tried often to bring that history to life. And so to the best of my ability, I put what I think would have been the real thoughts in their head and the conversations to the best of my ability that happened. And I use my fictional character, uh, Vicente Bolivar, to cast a spotlight on the events, but especially on Fidel, because if you just took Fidel at his word, you know, he was a messiah. <laughs> and, you know, well, that's well I mean, the, the doves appeared, so. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find anywhere how he managed to pull that off, so. <laughs> he seems like he was quite the showman. Um, yes. <laughs> I think there may be some leaders since him who, who took some notes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a, a comment that came in from Rose and Paul. It says, thank you, Matt. Gives me some insight on how our battle with Cuba originated. My brother was at Gitmo from 1962 to 1964. He tells tales of this time there as, and it wasn't a great time. Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, and we have another comment that came in that says, thank you, Matt. Very interesting talk. Um, if anyone has any more questions, this is, we have another minute or so to, to um, ask our presenter. So go ahead and type them in. And real quick while I wait for just a moment, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the things that I was so struck by, and I think probably anyone who listened to what you just said, um, was again, how this ragtag bunch of, of folks, you know, managed to accomplish such a huge feat. 
Um, could you talk a little bit more about the military portion, their strategy, and um, did any of them have any previous experience in fighting uh, in guerrilla warfare or otherwise, or were they just young folks and they managed to make it happen? You know, Fidel did a lot of the training early on before the uh, initial attack on the Moncada Barracks in 1953. And he had no idea what he was doing. And that's why it was such a dismal failure. Um, in Mexico, where he spent uh, close to a year uh, training, he did bring in an old military person from the uh, Spanish Cuban, uh, uh, Spanish Wars of Independence, a guy by the name of Alberto Bayo. And he did some training. But if you remember, of the 81 people that invaded, only 18 survived. So right, those 18 right. were the only ones that had, you know, the benefit of his training. But amongst those were Che Guevara, mm -hmm. um, you know, Raul Castro, Fidel Castro, Camilo Sinvigos, Juan Ameda, these people that became the top leaders and faces of the revolution. And uh, so probably his training helped. But then they, uh, learned on their own. Yeah, it seemed and, like there was know, they quite a bit of trial and error there. <laughs> they, they traveled through the mountains for over a year, never staying the same place two nights in a row and uh, attacking small garrisons and just kind of gaining in numbers. And so I, I think you had a few different questions there. Did I answer all of them? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. We did have one last question come in from Joel. It says, what was Fidel's relation with the church during the revolution and how did it evolve? Um, during the revolution, his relation with the church still seemed fairly close, or his people did anyways. Um, as I spoke to earlier, he stayed close with the Archbishop of Santiago, and uh, who helped intervene and save his life after the uprising <coughs> in uh, the Moncada military barracks. And actually, when he enters Santiago, uh, in early January of 1959, uh, as the de facto ruler of Cuba, his people have taken Havana and he enters Santiago. He's going to uh, give a speech to the crowd there. And at his side is the Archbishop Serantes of Santiago. And so at this point, he still seems to be close with the church. Um, I think, you know, he has problems with some of the corruption that churches have been involved with throughout history and maybe in Cuba. Uh, but I think he still overall has a good sense of them. Um, somewhere in that period from 1959 to, you know, 1963, you know, the one person had a brother in <laughs> Gitmo from 62 to 64. Those were tough years. But in 60, you know, you're going to have the Bay of Pigs invasion, and then you're going to have the Cuban Missile Crisis. And somewhere in there, you know, I think he embraces communism as his only means of survival. And Cuba was going to be uh, swallowed by the United States and uh, probably become the 51st state or have another dictator put in place because they didn't like what he was doing. And so he embraced the Soviet Union as a survival method. And part of that is he had to turn his back on religion because the communists do not believe in religion. Right. I mean, he's frequently, his ideology is frequently described as like Marxist-Leninist ideology. Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, I, I, I love this comment that just came in. It says, I'm amazed that this group of very young revolutionaries were able to transition to bureaucrats and without getting assassinated. Um, so that's it's a good point it's a good point um, you know i i saw this really interesting film and diagnosis of you know the assassination but uh there were 700 assassination attempts on fidel castro's oh, life after wow. he came into power many of them proven to be cia backed mm -hmm. and whatnot everything from exploding cigars to you know poisons to <laughs> i mean every possible means was attempted to assassinate him. Mm. So him living was 
indeed, you know, surprising. Um, and of course, the most important question of all, where can we purchase your book? Now, the library has purchased a copy, so that's one spot we can find it. But where can folks who want to own your book buy it? You can certainly order it through any bookstore. In these times, I'm not sure who's carrying them and whether they're open, but they have the ability to order the book if they don't have it on their shelves at the time. Or you can, of course, go to Amazon or pretty much any place books are sold. You can get I Am Cuba, Fidel Castro, and the Cuban Revolution. I actually just had my first mystery novel, Mainly Power, published a couple months uh, last month in September. And that uh, series will be coming out another one in December and one in March of next year, uh, the Mainly Mystery series. And that will also be available wherever. Um, and yes, Matt and I were talking earlier and we are definitely going to have him back to discuss some of these other books and hopefully we can bring him back at some point to discuss them in person at the Camden Public Library. Um, Matt, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. This was a very interesting conversation and a very well researched presentation. So I, uh, we're getting more comments to say thank you so much, Matt. Very interesting. Um, definitely a, a, highlight of our History Month programming that we've um, offered here this October. It's offered some nice diversity to talk about someplace, someplace else, um, and, and that place is Cuba. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up and remind folks that you can watch the recording of this um, on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. So if you enjoyed it, please visit it there and then share it with people so that they can learn this interesting information as well. And I look forward to seeing more folks, uh, or some of you folks at future presentations. So once again, good night, everybody. And good night, Matt. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Julia. Good night. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs>